this time on Psychic Investigators. When a college student vanishes, everyone's looking. None of her friends had any information, had no idea where Kim Antonakis was. Then, a psychic sees a twisted plot. I knew there were men. I knew they were waiting for her. They could feel the ropes. And says she's in grave danger. They say she played in a sandbox that she didn't belong in. Can the psychic help to solve the mystery of what happened to Kim Antonakis? I knew she was alive, and I knew they had to find her right away. Brooklyn, New York. In 1995, the borough suffers more than its fair share of the city's long tradition of crime and violence. A place where sometimes innocent people get hurt. It's nearly 4 a.m. on March 1st. After a night out in Manhattan, 20-year-old college student Kim Antonakis drops her friend, Liz Pace, at her apartment in Canarsie. then drives a few blocks to her own apartment. Later that day, Kim's dad gets a call. Kim is a no-show at her part-time job. It's totally out of character. Tommy Antonakis immediately calls Kim's friends. No one has seen her. Tommy came into the precinct shortly after not being able to get in contact with his daughter. I think it was about a day and he had come into the 69th Precinct in Canarsie to make a missing persons report. Generally, the police wait 24 hours to investigate a missing person, but this time, they move fast. I don't know, something just said, you yeah, know, run with this one. I don't have a good feeling about this case. Detective Phil Tricola is on duty that day. I reported to the missing person squad, and I started to open up a case and, and investigate this myself. Pretty and vivacious. Kim is popular and has a wide circle of friends. An only child, her parents are divorced. Her father, a successful businessman, lives close by. Her mother, in Florida. Kimberly was a sweet girl, but naive. She had a little fire. She was a lot of fun. She was, she had a good way about us, so she had a generous heart. Detective Tricola suggests Tommy check Kim's parking spot for her car. And then he called me, and he says, I think you need to come here. I, I found something. Our car was not there, but there was an earring on the garage floor. Don't know if that earring was there, fell out of a car, if she was wearing it, but I realized one person would know if she was wearing it, and that'd be Liz Pace. Kim's friend, Liz Pace, confirms Kim was wearing both earrings the previous night. Now I know that the car was in that garage, Kim was out of the car, and that earring fell off. I knew she was a victim of a crime. There was no doubt in my mind. The detective's first thought is that Kim may have been carjacked. I immediately put an alarm out over the NYPD's internal computer system describing her uh, to be on the lookout. I got in contact with the aviation bureau, and I asked them to look at the spots where cars are normally dumped. Oh, we're out there nonstop. I guess the adrenaline kicks in. Sleep don't matter. I live on Long Island. Every night that I left Canarsie, I drive through uh, parts of East New York, which are known auto stripping parts. Uh, people steal cars, auto strip them, and dump them. Uh, cars are recovered all the time in certain desolate parts of Brooklyn. But Detective Tricola finds nothing. Later that day, when Kim's father arrives home, his answering machine is flashing. But there are no messages. Curiously, someone has phoned and hung up, twice. The police check morgues and hospitals. Nothing. They speak to Kim's friends and neighbors, and to the couple staying at Kim's place, Joshua Torres and April Dadali. None of her friends had any information, had no idea where Kim Antonakis was. Two days pass with no sign of Kim. 
her mother Marlene arrives from Florida. A family friend suggests that Marlene see psychic Ellie Crystal. A woman called me, quite hysterical actually, and she asked for a reading. She had to have it that night. It was an emergency. This was Kim's mom, Marlene, who had called me. Host of her own local cable show, Crystal calls herself a medium. She says spirits come to her from the bridge outside her window. I realized after I lived here for a while that it's almost like harmonics. The two end posts are like uh, tuning forks, and the cables represent the harmonics. They, spirits seem to be very drawn and attracted to the bridge, and it's just kind of became like a dimensional doorway for me. Two days after Kim's disappearance, her mother Marlene arrives with one of her daughter's friends at Ellie Crystal's Brooklyn apartment. They showed me a picture. I started seeing images. I knew she was alive, and I knew they had to find her right away. Kim Antonakis has been missing for three days. Brooklyn police suspect foul play, but they have no real leads. Her mother asks a psychic for help. Ellie Crystal says her daughter is alive, but in grave danger. The psychic channels the young woman's spirit and tries to pinpoint her location. To go into her body is to feel very cold and very chilled. Her whole uh, energy was very weak and fading. I felt she was dehydrated. She has not eaten, and that if somebody didn't find her very soon, she would die. Ellie Crystal says she can see what the police already suspect, that Kimberly has been abducted. I feel that she made an attempt to escape, but they got her. So you could feel that, you know, she had been taken as a prisoner. You could feel the ropes and there was definitely this feeling of being tied up. I also felt that whoever was involved in this abduction knew her very well. I knew they were men. I knew they were waiting for her. This is kids who are getting either back at her or looking to get some money from the family. It was one or the other. Marlene was crying. She started to cry right away. The whole thing was an extremely emotional reading. Before the session closes, the psychic has one more cryptic clue. The letter J was a letter that came to me at the time. I saw it as children would write uh, their letter J. It was connected to the person who, who had taken her. It came as a male and young, and Brooklyn. Marlene promises to pass on the paranormal clues to the police. But first, back at Kim's apartment, friends and family have gathered to listen to the psychic's tape. I see her tied up. Tied up. Abducted. The letter J. Suddenly, Kim's roommate Josh Torres and his friend Julio Negron jump to their feet. They say that they're going out to search for Kim. At three that morning, a fire crew responds to a fire in an empty house on 86th Avenue in Woodhaven, Queens. The flames are easily checked, but in the basement, a grim discovery, a half-charred human body. The long hair suggests it's a woman. There was a remnants of a chair. Uh, the body was burnt beyond recognition. Queen's homicide detective Louis Pia was assigned to the case. She had no shoes on. She was uh, partially bound with her hands behind her back and her feet were, were bound with duct tape. Arson investigators established the fire was set intentionally with gasoline. The coroner's report reveals the woman was burned alive. We started making calls. We had a body and we wanted to see if people uh, had reported anybody missing. So we called uh, the missing person squad. We were told that there was two individuals 
one of which uh, was a female in a 6'9 uh, precinct who was reported missing a few days earlier by her father. And that's when the phone rang. And it was the Queens. And they had said they had a female deceased, victim of a, uh, of, a of a homicide that fit the description of Kim Antonakis. A description that includes some unique body art. Kimberly Antonakis had some very distinctive tattoos uh, on her back, on her leg. The tattoos, an infinity sign, a scorpion. It's almost certainly Kim Antonakis. I got Tommy sitting at my desk, and I, I walked out. I couldn't even look at Tom. I went into another office, and I sat there. My week came to a screeching halt. And my worst fears came true. I just couldn't bring myself to go back out and talk to Tom. But I, I knew I had to, so I, I did. And he's like, what's going on? I said, you know, Tom, I said, there's some guys are going to come in here and, and talk to you in a couple of minutes. That was it. My case ended. Case closed. So we took a ride over to the 6-9 precinct. It was very difficult to, to tell him that we, we had a body that was burned beyond recognition, and we're going to need dental records to positively confirm that uh, the individual was his daughter. A missing person case is now a homicide investigation. A 21-year-old New York woman missing for three days has been found dead, burned alive. A psychic says the letter J is connected to her killer. When the brutal crime hits the headlines, even jaded New Yorkers are outraged. Your mind starts playing games. You get angry. You want to look for the people that did it. They tied her up in this cold basement, totally dark, and just left her there. Pete Donahue covers the story for the New York Daily News. This is, it was a very normal neighborhood. I mean, you, it's not a neighborhood that you would drive through and, and, and expect something like this to happen at all. Um, just, you know, nice, modest, you know, middle-class homes. And the neighbors were shocked that something like this could happen. Weeks go by. Though the police have several suspects on their radar, they don't have enough evidence for an arrest. The psychic was right about the abduction, about Kim being tied up and close to death. Could she help the police to find the killer? Tom Antonakis would call on a, on a daily basis, and he would say, listen, guys, you know, if nothing is going on and you have nothing at this point in time, would you go see a psychic? I shouldn't talk for anyone else, but my, my assumption was that it was all, you know, full of baloney. But I couldn't tell Tom. Tommy called and he said that Marlene was impressed with the information I had given her and could he come by with two police officers? And I said, absolutely, no problem. On the following Saturday, Tommy, his brother Joey, Detective Pia and his partner visit Ellie Crystal. The crystal balls, I don't believe in them. Well, Tommy, his motivation was to find out what happened and whatever it took whether it took uh, seances or a crystal ball, he would do it to my brother. One of the policemen, the one sitting closer to me, he asked a lot of questions. This is when Kim started coming to me. She told us that uh, there were four uh, individuals involved in the homicide. She said that, that she saw the letter J as being um, the first letter of uh, the names of the individuals involved. She kept seeing the letter J. The letter J resonates with the police. Joshua Torres, who is temporarily staying with Kim with his wife and baby, is a suspect, as are his friends Jose Negron and Julio Negron, who, despite their names, are not related. Another friend of Torres, Nicholas Labretti, goes by the street name Little J. Four suspects, four men whose names start with J, one of whom was living in Kim's apartment. What do you look for? Hmm? Justice? 
Vengeance. So many things go through your mind. I mean, this was front page news. It was shocking and, and puzzling, and, and it was very difficult for people to come to grips with what happened. People were petrified. They didn't know, you know, who was walking down their sidewalk in the middle of the night, you know. Despite the psychic's clues, it seems the police are no closer to closing the murder case. Weeks, then months pass. Then, on September 6, 1995, six months after Kim Antonakis disappeared, the police catch a major break. Friends of Joshua Torres, the guy who was temporarily staying at Kim's apartment, say he's been bragging about her murder. And I got a call from the detective, and uh, he basically said to me, listen, I got this, this girl and guy in here, and they're alleging that this guy, Joshua Torres, confessing that he burned Kimberly Antonakis, abducted her for a ransom, and, and so on, and gave all the particulars. From that point on, the investigation started to go full force. First, the police bring Joshua's friend Julio Negron in for questioning, and he eventually cracks. We, we interviewed him at great length, and he actually confessed, and he agreed to cooperate uh, with the district attorney's office. And then from there, we went and, um, and we grabbed Joshua and Nick Libretti simultaneously on the same day. Torres, the roommate, denies everything. But Nick Libretti, faced with Julio Negron's confession, also cracks. Between them, they reveal a kidnapping scheme that went very, very wrong. All they had to do was just ask. We wouldn't both would have gave anything to have her back. Involved were Joshua Torres, Nicholas Libretti, AKA Little J, Julio Negron, and Jose Negron. All J's, just as the psychic predicted. This was just animals that were fools and they were idiots. The trial of Joshua Torres, the ringleader, opens on November 1st, 1996. He pleads innocent. Josh Torres is a particularly twisted and grotesque personality. He's an evil individual. Gene Reebstein prosecutes the case. I believe Josh thought she was a good target for ransom demand because he could tell, one, that she had a lot of resources, and two, that her family cared for her. The way he looked at it there is there's money there and there's affection there. And those are two things Josh knows. Well, to get one, he knows how to use the other. Torres, who already had a criminal record, easily roped his friends into a scheme. The prosecution argues that at approximately 4 a.m. on March 1, 1995, as Kim Antonakis parked her car in the garage across from her Brooklyn apartment, Nicholas and Jose grabbed her and drove her to a vacant home in Queens. There, they tied her up in the basement with no heat, no food, and no water, and left her for three days. Joshua Torres phoned Kim's father twice to play a pre-recorded ransom demand. But by accident, he played the ransom tape too early for it to be recorded. Later, when Joshua and Julio heard the recording of the psychic session, they panicked, thinking she was onto them. That same night, they drove over to Queens, planning to set Kim free. But after three days in the cold without food and water, she was comatose. The cruel bungling gang assumed she was dead. Joshua decided to burn the evidence. These guys, uh, Torres and Liberty, had absolutely no remorse. I mean, you got the sense that they just, they just looked like uh, at other people like bugs. You know, they just, they had no feeling. They had no sense of value of life. The jury hears that just as Joshua Torres lit the fatal match, he whispered to Kim, life sucks. Despite the evidence, Joshua denies all the charges, but the jury thinks otherwise. And Tommy said, he didn't want the death penalty for these guys. He wanted them to suffer as long as possible. And he should rot in jail for the rest of his life, and he should never come out. Joshua Torres is convicted of arson, kidnapping, and first-degree murder.
and sentenced to 58 years. As for Nicholas Labretti, or Little Jay, he's also sentenced to 58 years, but dies in prison of AIDS less than two years later. A year later, in November 1996, Julio Negron is sentenced to six years as an accessory because he did nothing to stop the crime. Jose Negron never gets to trial, as in June 1995, he was gunned down on a street in Queens. From the beginning, the psychic seemed to key in so clearly to Kim and her killers. One of the things from, from Ellie's reading that I was present at that was uh, astonishing was that she was right on the money with, with the letter J. I mean, you had Joshua, you had Julio, you had Jose Negron, okay? And you also had an individual that uh, we were looking at in the investigation that was known as Little J. I think there are psychics out there that are good at what they do. I think they do have that extra sense. It's kind of like an enhanced gut feeling. The last time I saw Tommy, he told me that everything had been taken care of. There was a feeling with Tommy of completion that whatever this whole scenario was that involved his daughter's kidnapping and murder and the capturing of the criminals, it had come to a conclusion already. It was over. After that, I knew I wasn't going to see Tommy again. It was hard after. That was daddy's little girl, 100%. She had him wrapped. Can't put it any better than that. That, that was his, his, his heart. Tommy went to Kimberly's grave regularly. He went there on her birthday. He went there on holidays. He invited me to, to come after one of the verdicts. And he went and he said, you know, we did it, baby. We got that piece of garbage. In 2005, 10 years after his daughter's grisly death, Tommy dies of cancer. I think in the end, um, he felt he had nothing to live for. He died of a broken heart. 